The following program presents principles designed to promote good health and is not intended to take the place of personalized professional care. The opinions and ideas expressed are those of the speaker. Viewers are encouraged to draw their own conclusions about the information presented. Hello and welcome to Health for a Lifetime. I'm your host, Don McIntosh. We're glad you're with us today. We're talking with Dr. Neil Nedley. And Dr. Nedley, welcome. Thank you. We're going to be looking at some current studies as of 2008 and uh, just brand new studies. Yes. And we're going to be looking at things that kind of a hodgepodge, you will, but these are fascinating studies and they're very helpful. We're going to look in the, you know, in the first half here at, at you know, high caffeine drinks. You maybe heard about those. And we're going to be looking then also at um, vitamin D. It might not seem like it's important stuff, but it's, it, it is very important, isn't it? Absolutely. So why don't we just start out with a, with a high dosage of, uh, of a caffeine drink here and see what that does to us. Well, we actually have a graphic that goes <laughs> along with this study. Uh, there's a drink called Red Bull. It's an energy drink that is used by a lot of university and college students as well as athletes and those in extreme sports. Uh, and even race car drivers. Uh, the problem with it is it can increase the risk of heart attack and stroke significantly, uh, even in younger individuals that don't have any cardiovascular disease. And so uh, this uh, study was just uh, uh, published, and uh, it was actually done by a group in Australia. And uh, this Australian group was studying this drink that actually comes out of Austria. And I didn't realize how pervasive Red Bull is, uh, but it actually uh, has sold 3.5 billion cans in 143 countries. Wow. So lots of people are drinking this, and uh, what does it do to you? Well, what it does is it actually tightens blood vessels and it makes your blood vessels and your circulation as if you've already got heart disease and atherosclerosis, even though you don't have it. It causes the blood platelets to get sticky and the viscosity of the blood to go up. And so the platelets are those things that come out when you're going to have a clot. That's right. You want to have platelets that work well. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with them is if they work too well, because if they get toward a more narrowed area or where you might have some calcium in the blood vessel, those platelets can think the blood vessel is damaged and they can all gather together and uh, cause an artery to actually close off. So you said platelets, which is a clotting factor, and viscosity, which means it's just really thick. In other words, the blood's clumping together. And uh, how does that uh, cause that to happen? How does caffeine cause that to happen? Well, uh, caffeine actually does play, it, it is a drug, you know, mm -hmm. it ends in I-N-E, it does play with little things on platelet molecules called adenosine. It blocks adenosine receptors, and uh, that makes the platelets not work uh, like they're supposed to. So it goes in, and it, is this true with any caffeine drink, not just Red Bull? Well, and that's the, you know, the study was done on Red Bull, and Red Bull has 80 milligrams of caffeine. Uh, in it in one drink and that's equivalent to a cup of coffee and so the studies researchers say you know we need to study a cup of coffee in the same way maybe it has the same risk we do know that coffee has the same amount of caffeine and we know caffeine is the main problem with Red Bull but uh, coffee might have some advantages over Red Bull and that is coffee has cocoa which is an antioxidant uh, and antioxidants can um, kind of mitigate it yeah, against that. Yeah, mitigate against it slightly. So the bad things are kind of weighed out by something else that makes it a little less bad. <laughs> right, but with Red Bull, you're not getting really any of the good stuff. And it turns out, um, one hour after they drank Red Bull, uh, they were their blood vessels were no longer normal and uh, it increased their risk of heart attack and stroke after just one drink. 
And this is even with kids, with teenagers and whatnot? With teenagers as well. And uh, the problem uh, with this is it's being marketed to this young age group. And in fact, uh, you know, it's even Formula One racing, you know, advertises Red Bull and it says it will give you wings. Mm. Uh, you know, and young people are wanting to get and sprout wings and they think the caffeine will make them feel like they have those wings. And in a sense, because of the stimulation that it does, uh, they might get that feeling. But unfortunately, uh, that feeling is not associated with the same benefits to the heart and blood vessels. In fact, it's the opposite benefit. So basically, the take-home message is, you know, no matter what the brand name is, something that's high in caffeine that's going to try and just excite you is going to set you up for real problems, and you could just rue the day you ever drank the drink. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that a lot of people who sell caffeine have been trying to talk about the benefits, you know, of caffeine drinks. And, you know, they have to really try to stretch uh, to try to show benefits. And, yes, it does stimulate, but it is a drug. And, unfortunately, it causes habituation. And if you withdraw from it and get severe splitting headaches, that's a clue that this thing isn't very good for you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, no good natural food... Uh, that is good for the heart or good for the blood vessels when you withdraw from it, you get splitting headaches. You mm -hmm. know, that's just not the way it is for healthy um, chemicals. Uh, but caffeine is not one of those. One last thing before we go from that then to vitamin D, and that is uh, the mental performance of some of the drinks that drink like this. You know, you're a race car driver and different things, that, and they're encouraging people in athletics. Does it make you more proficient? Can you focus more? Are you... Is your, is your mental ability increased by it? Well, uh, there have been studies done on that as well. Typists type a little bit faster under the influence of caffeine, but they make 10 times as many errors. <laughs> well, I uh, guess that's not very helpful unless you have a spell checker. You know, if you're, a, if you're a lineman in a football game or, you know, if you're trying to race down the sidelines, the caffeine actually does seem to help. But you don't want to give it to the quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> because the quarterback needs to have good analytical thinking. He needs to be quick. Right. Uh, but even more important than quickness is the decision that he's making with that ball. And so... Uh, so if you have one decision, which is, I've got to run this way, versus 30 options as a quarterback, then it's a little... Exactly. It's okay for the one option person. It's okay for the one option person, it, you know, during that time. But unfortunately, it's setting them up for heart disease and, right. and problems. So really, I wouldn't even recommend it for them. But as far as the athletic performance is concerned, it doesn't seem to be adverse except if you're in the decision-making role. Well, I, I just can't help myself, but one more question on that. That's all right. I've, I've actually been, you know, I, I attend a lot of places of worship in my line of work, and uh, of all different denominations, and in some denominations, and well, it's actually across all denominations, uh, there's this increased um, kind of Starbucks or mentality that in the lobby you have maybe some kind of foods like usually high f fatty and sugary foods along with maybe a caffeine type drink. What does that do to your ability to, to listen to a sermon or listen to a message or a lecture? Yeah, it really decreases the ability significantly. In fact, you know, if you were to drink a Red Bull before you went to a university lecture, uh, trying to explain <laughs> some, you know, advanced concept at all, you would lose focus. Uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to um, uh, stand it. You'd want to get up and you'd want to move and you wouldn't really want to, you know, stay with uh, the lecturer and stay with the learning uh, aspect of things. So maybe that's why they, they add in a little exercise uh, at the beginning of the service too sometimes. You know, you'll have a pep rally and you have some of the, what is that to calm them down? Or maybe that they feel like they got to do that. I don't know, the two seem to kind of work together. I thought it was an interesting yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend it. You know, the spirituality is to be for the enhancement of the frontal lobe of the brain. Mm -hmm. I mean, the frontal lobe is the crown of the brain, and this is the area that really needs to be expanded. And when the frontal lobe is compromised, we make poorer decisions. Uh, we end up with greater risk of depression. We end up with greater risk of problem children, et cetera, when we're parenting them. And so we really want to enhance frontal lobe function, and caffeine does not enhance it. Mm -hmm. uh, caffeine blocks adenosine receptors in the frontal lobe. And uh, studies show that when you have caffeine on board, you're more likely to gossip than when you don't have caffeine on board. And so, you know, even things like that are affected by it. So I would say if we're really wanting to enter into a worshipful experience, uh, let's leave the frontal lobe suppressants out of the picture. Let's talk about vitamin D. Um, we gave them enough to think about maybe with that little segment, but let's go into vitamin D. 
Yes. Uh, very interesting study on vitamin D. We also have a graphic uh, in regards to this. Vitamin D has now been shown to help colorectal cancer patients. Uh, and uh, this is very exciting. Uh, you can see the man there uh, getting his vitamin D. It is direct sunlight that is one of the best ways of getting vitamin D. Uh, it uh, produces an active hormone in the body uh, that we know prevents cancer. But this is now a study done on uh, people who already have the cancer. Hmm. And uh, in fact, you know, for years, Don, there have been many people who have tried to give certain vitamins in pills to prevent cancer. You know, the beta carotene study, mm -hmm. uh, where they were giving beta carotene to thousands of people and then other people getting a placebo. No benefit. Vitamin C has been tried, you know, a small benefit with vitamin C, you know, maybe one or two percentage points at the most. Uh, but there are nutrients that you can take that can significantly decrease your risk of cancer. And we're talking 50, 60, 70 percent reductions in cancer. And that, those nutrients are vitamin D and calcium, uh, particularly together. And so, uh, and this is just studies done in the last two years. Uh, but this actual study that we're quoting from 2008 shows that it extended lives of people with colon and rectal cancer. Uh, previous research, of course, had shown that they're less likely to develop colon and rectal cancer. Uh, if they have higher amounts of vitamin D uh, in both women and men. Women are much less likely to develop breast cancer. Uh, mm. Both women and men are much less likely to develop hematologic cancers. Um, you know, the blood. Right, blood-related uh, uh, cancers. Uh, this was a new study uh, led by Dr. Ng of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. It involved 304 men and women diagnosed with colorectal cancer from 1991 to 2002. And what they did is they went back and looked at their vitamin D levels to see if there was any relationship to how long they lived. And this study was just published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, and they uh, found that the blood vitamin D levels uh, were related to how long they lived. Hmm. These vitamin D levels were tracked for an average of about six and a half years, and those in the highest 25% of vitamin D levels were 50% less likely to die during the study from their cancer or any other cause compared to the patients with the lowest 25% of vitamin D levels. And so if you're just in the upper fourth of individuals, uh, after you have cancer, you're going to be able to extend your life significantly. I mean, double your risk of living, essentially. Or of dying. Uh, if you have a low vitamin D, you right. double your risk of dying. Wow. So vitamin D then, you can't get it from anywhere except for sunlight or where else? Well, you can get it in supplements. Supplements. Uh, and Which is the best, supplements or one or the other or both, or can you overdo it? Oh, you can overdo vitamin D. Vitamin D is fat soluble. So what I would recommend, you know, as, a, as an internal medicine physician, anyone who has cancer, particularly colorectal cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, I recommend that they get their vitamin D level drawn and they see what their 25 hydroxy vitamin D level. Don't get the 125 because that varies a lot throughout the day. It's the 25 hydroxy and that will tell you where your vitamin D stores are and then you can see whether you may need to supplement. And if you're really low, if you're in the bottom fourth, you really need to get mega doses of vitamin D in. Sunlight for a few days isn't going to be enough mm -hmm. to get you up there. You need to get some mega doses, prescription doses of vitamin D to get it up there and then maintain it with either supplements or with um, sunlight. We've been talking to Dr. Neil Nedley. We're talking about vitamin D and it's important. When we come back we'll continue a little bit of that discussion and then look at some more new research. Join us when we come back. <laughs> 